International Life is here to interview Professor Ian Stewart of the University of Warwick, mathematician, writer and broadcaster. Ian, where does your love of mathematics come from? I started, I liked mathematics when I was in primary school. It was a subject which for some reason appealed to me. I'm aware that a lot of people don't feel that way. But I loved it. And I was very fortunate when I was about 12 or 13, I had a really good mathematics teacher. Um, and he went out of his way to show some of the boys in the class, and it was boys because it was a boys' grammar school, um, material that wasn't part of the school mathematics syllabus. And of course that was much more interesting. It was interesting just because it wasn't part of the syllabus. We felt we were getting let in on some of the secrets of more advanced mathematics. Um, so he spent several hours a week um, just with a group of about five of us showing us what mathematics was really like, all the sorts of things you could do with it. And I, that just cemented my love of mathematics. You've just brought out a new book called 17 Equations That Changed the World. What prompted you to write it? It was actually suggested by a Dutch publishing company that translates books from English. And they said, um, has anyone got a book on equations, mathematical equations, explaining what they're really about? And the more we thought about this, we thought, well, there are one or two, but they don't quite fit that bill. But that's really rather a good idea. Um, why not take the thing that most people actually hate about mathematics, which is the formulas, the equations, the thing that everyone says, put these in a book and it's, it's dead, it's not going to sell. Um, and follow the um, show business advice, if you've got a wooden leg, wave it. Uh, in other words, make a virtue of something that people may otherwise uh, not find very interesting. So we thought, well, what we're going to do is select a number of equations which have had a really, really big effect on human history and tell their story. And the equation itself, you don't have to understand what the equation means, although we try to explain that, but it's where it came from, who did it, what kind of work came out of it, what it was for when they invented it, and what we do with it now. And one of the principles was every single equation that we talk about has to actually be buried somewhere inside a piece of modern technology, your mobile phone, uh, the food processor in your kitchen, um, your washing machine, your car, whatever. It should be something that is there in daily life, but unless you are made aware of it, you don't realise it's there. It's a secret equation which actually makes everything work. What exciting advances are being made in the application of maths to biology systems? Biology is one of the great areas for new and really interesting mathematical problems. In the past it was the physical sciences. You always think of astronomy and physics as the places where, where the mathematical equations come up. And biology traditionally was the science you went into if you wanted to stay away from mathematics to some extent. It was always a bit of a shock to the biologists when they had to do statistics, for example, but uh, they got used to that. But these days, because of the big advances in molecular biology, the way we can get right deep down inside living creatures and start to figure out important things like DNA, the genetic code, sequencing the human genome, um, but also how evolution works, how ecosystems work. All of these pose problems to do with, I've got this process, and I can understand all of the bits and pieces of the process, but what happens when you put them all together? What does it do? How does it do it? And these are problems that mathematics was really invented to solve. You can't just look at the DNA sequence of something and work out what it does. So mathematics is increasingly being used in a kind of partnership with biology. And the wonderful thing for mathematicians is what, what we get out of it is new problems. It's not just new things we can use our existing mathematics on. In a sense, that's a bit boring. The really exciting stuff is new problems where we're going to have to invent new mathematics to solve them and to understand what's going on. What maths is used in the development of new techniques in evolutionary circuitry design? There's some wonderful work that's been done. Um, 
Okay, evolution, the idea is evolution of an animal. You, you, its successive generations are simply selective for being better at something. You make random changes and you see which one of those make it better, which ones don't. You throw away the ones that don't, you keep the ones that make it better, and then you do it again. Now that's a mathematical process. Take some structure, take random variations on that structure, examine them to see which ones are good at something, take those, repeat. So it's a lovely mathematical problem. But one of the most interesting things that happened was um, done with engineering hardware. An electronic engineer decided he was going to evolve a circuit to do something very, very simple. I think it was to distinguish a, a constant signal from some oscillating signal. And so he just had a, a kind of programmable circuit and he randomly modified the program, tested his circuit on these signals, worked out whether they could tell the difference, and once he got something that could tell the difference a bit better, he would start again using that circuit. And what happened was, for about the first 200 attempts, it was dreadful, it wouldn't do anything. He just kept changing it, ran the variation, and it was performing extraordinarily badly, but he just kept going. And after about 250 attempts, he got a circuit which started to be able to distinguish these two signals. And so take that one, take variations on that one, and by the time he'd done about 500 of these um, steps through the process, he'd come up with a circuit that not only could, could distinguish the two signals extremely effectively, but it was a much simpler circuit than any human engineer would ever have invented. Not only that, if you looked at the circuit as a competent electronic engineer, you would look at it and say, I don't understand how that works. So the evolutionary process had produced a more efficient circuit for doing the job, but because it was evolutionary, it didn't sort of break the problem down into little bits and pieces the way a human would and then solve those and fit them together. It just did the whole thing in one go. Um, now there's some interesting mathematical problems to do with how does that kind of thing really work. Because not only do you get this evolving circuit, but the end result is not the kind of thing you might have predicted. So we need to do some math to understand how that kind of process works. Will we see more game software in future being used to educate in mathematics like Foldit in biology? I think we will. Foldit is a wonderful idea. Um, one of the big problems in, in biology is to do with proteins. Um, the DNA sequence for a protein tells you the sequence of building blocks, amino acids, for that protein. But it's not just a sequence. In reality, what happens is it all folds up into a very complicated shape. And it's very, very difficult mathematically to predict the shape from the sequence. But it's much easier to work out the sequence than it is to determine the shape. So biologists would absolutely love to be able to just look at the sequence and predict the shape. What Folded does is say, let's turn that problem in a mathematical formulation into a computer game. The idea is the shape it takes is the one with least energy. So you can show the people playing the game who need to know absolutely nothing about the mathematics or indeed the biology, but show them the shape of the, a shape of the protein and the program calculates its energy and then say, OK, the game is you make changes to that shape by moving it around and if you can make the energy lower, then you're winning. And what's happened is that there's a great band of people who are now playing this game and they've got so good at it, they seem to be able to guess what sort of changes you should make to a protein to lower its energy. And they're finding better solutions to this problem than some of the mathematical techniques achieve. So the, the wonderful thing here is you can play the game. It's a lot of fun if you get into that kind of thing and get used to the rules. Uh, you're doing real science. And it's science that has a genuine payoff. The scientists really do want to know improved versions of the shapes of these proteins. So here is a wonderful example of how to harness 
the, the, the human mind's ability to visualize things, to intuit things, put it in a framework that is fun to do, namely games, and um, harness the enthusiasm of human beings for playing games in a really significant way. And I think that's a prototype for many other problems of scientific interest that you could also imagine formulating as a game. And because it's a game, people are much more willing to spend a lot of time doing it. If I went out and said, this is a really interesting problem, we're trying to minimise the energy of a protein molecule, most people would say, yeah, sure, OK, that's for scientists, that's not for me. But if you say, here's a really nice visual game, well, no, that's a very different matter.